Welcome to the program today. My name is Manu Gonzalez, and I have in studio with me a very special guest all the way from Amman, Jordan, Joel Kramer, who has written a book where God came down the archaeological evidence. And uh, welcome, Joel. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, the, you know, we here at Prophecy Watchers, um, you know, we have been bringing prophecy, of course, for a long time, e even our, our main host, Gary uh, Stearman. But one of the things that we've liked to do is we see how prophecy uh, brings forth and shows the reliability of Scripture, and that's one of the reasons why we spend time talking about biblical archaeology. And um, so, but for our audience, kind of introduce yourself to them. And I, I've known of you for at least probably 10, 15 years, but kind of give an insight of where, where you've been coming from and what you've been doing for the last decade or more. Yeah, I, uh, my name is Joel Kramer, and uh, yeah, I was in Utah, the state of Utah, for many years. I grew up in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia. My dad worked for the oil company, but um, I moved over to uh, Israel. Gosh, it's been going on 16 years ago now. And I went over to, uh, I was making videos, and, uh, and I wanted to study archaeology because I'm trying to reason with people. Uh, that the Bible has all this evidence, and um, we're not we're not talking about fairy tales here. We're talking about real people and real events, and uh, and real history that happened. And um, and so for some, especially uh, kind of with a secular mentality, hopefully it challenges them to uh, really consider what the Bible has to say. Intro this video. I want to show one of you, one of your video clips where you talk about the Bible and archaeology. Kind of give a give a twenty second intro on this video. Yeah, the um, the video I think you're referring to is is uh, I I go around and I ask a simple question. I ask um, uh, archaeologists that are working in Israel uh, if they use the Bible as a tool in their archaeology, and of course they do um, because. That's how you bring the meaning for what's being found in the ground is uh, you need an ancient text that comes from the time periods and the places that you're digging in order to interpret uh, the meaning of what's being found. And so uh, if the Bible is being ignored then uh, in archaeology, then then really, uh, you know, all kinds of mistakes are going to be made. And so um, over the years, that the, the main tool for biblical archaeology, all the archaeology that takes place in the places and the time periods the Bible is talking about, um, uses the Bible for that interpretation. Or if they don't, they should. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. So we're going to, for those of you watching by television or other means, t you know, Joel's videos are awesome. They're, they are, again, they are meant for evangelism and education and just inspiring. So take a watch. The first stop is the ancient city of Gezer to visit with dig director, Dr. Stephen Ortiz. Do you use the Bible as a tool in your archaeology here at Gezer? Yes, we use the Bible as a tool. The Bible mentions Tal Gezer a lot, and so we use the Bible to help us reconstruct the history. So we use the Bible and we use the archaeology to reconstruct what happened here. Jericho is famous as the biblical city where the walls came tumbling down. I stopped there to visit with archaeologist Dr. Titus Kennedy. In the book of Joshua, it says the Israelites destroyed Jericho and they burned the city. Right here we can see some of the toppled mud brick wall and clear evidence of a fire destruction. So Dr. Kennedy, do you use the Bible as a tool in your archaeology? Yes, I do. I find it extremely useful in not only locating sites, but helping us understand the historical record better. Next up was Dr. Aaron Mayer, who is the dig director at Gath, the hometown of Goliath. Do you use the Bible as a tool in your archaeology? The biblical text is an important source for learning about the, the ancient land of Israel in biblical times. Archaeologist Jeff Chadwick has served as an area supervisor at Gath for 15 years. Of course we use the Bible to try and understand uh, what happened here. If we didn't have these written records, we would have a lot harder time understanding what it is we find. 
In Jerusalem, excavations are currently being conducted by archaeologist Dr. Shimon Gibson. Do you use the Bible as a tool in your archaeology? The Bible can be illuminated by archaeology, there's no doubt about it. When you're excavating a place like this, which is referred to in the sources as the upper city, and when you come down on remains which date from the time of King Hezekiah, who's mentioned in the Old Testament, then it all comes alive. There is no question that the Bible is an important tool in archaeology. This is evident in the reality that archaeologists who excavate biblical places and periods, whether they are religious or secular, use the Bible as a tool in their archaeological work. Again, Joel, I appreciate the fact that you have, I remember when you got the drone and the footage and these are incredible. And uh, so it's pretty exciting. And we're gonna take a little break here because when we think about biblical archeology, span as many of you know, um, I've been trying to do a Bible archeology span in the magazine every month that, that we publish. And because there's so much going on in the land of Israel, again, that, that helps us to understand the reliability of scripture. So we're gonna take a little break here so you can see how you can get our magazine. Every day, the ancient prophecies of the Bible get more and more exciting as we watch world events come into perfect alignment with the words of the ancient prophets. Examine the pre-trib rapture doctrine taught by the Apostle Paul. Come to a deeper understanding of the giants of Genesis 6 and the real reason for the flood of Noah. Read the shocking things we see coming out of the world of science and technology, mind-blowing advances in transhumanism and artificial intelligence. Keep a close eye for a series of wars coming very soon to the Middle East. The Bible's a supernatural book, and we enjoy covering the fringe subjects and dark corners of Scripture as well. UFOs, the Nephilim, the miracles of the Bible, and so much more. It's a one-of-a-kind publication full of articles that will make you a Bible prophecy expert and prepare you for the future. We have a very special subscription offer for you today. For your gift of $50 or more to support the worldwide outreach of Prophecy Watchers, you can subscribe to either the digital version or the print version of our magazine. And here's the best part. In addition to receiving 12 monthly issues of the magazine, this offer comes with a fantastic bonus. Eight DVDs from some of the leading prophecy experts in the world today. Eight DVDs plus 12 issues of the magazine represents a $200 value but it's available today for your gift of just $50 or more to support the work of Prophecy Watchers. This offer is available anywhere in the USA and will ship both the magazine and the DVDs absolutely free. Don't wait or hesitate. Call the toll-free number on your screen or visit our online bookstore at prophecywatchers.tv to take advantage of this limited time offer. Looking at the future through the lens of Bible prophecy is the entire focus of this ministry. We're motivated like never before by our desire to tell the world that Jesus is the only answer for these troubling times. And we do believe that he's coming back very soon, just as he promised. Partner with us today. Help us take God's message of salvation through Jesus Christ to the whole world. So Joel, as we come back from the break here, one of the things that you bring up in the book, and I really want to now focus on your book, um, When God Came Down, looking at the evidence, one of the things that you do in the introduction, which I think is extremely helpful, because archaeology oftentimes, biblical archaeology, um, kind of has this mystical or romantic flavor to it at times, um, in the sense of people often speaking in, in terms of, well, biblical archaeology proves this or proves that. Um, talk about the ways, and use this puzzle analogy, kind of give us the background of that. Yeah, actually, um, I, I used that actual puzzle analogy with the students that I was teaching. And so I would go get these 500-piece uh, uh, jigsaw puzzles, and then I would throw all but five pieces away. And so then I would give uh, them the five pieces that were left and, and asked uh, if, if they believed that there was a, a whole puzzle that those came from. And of course, they understood that that was the case because these five pieces were the evidence that there once was this whole puzzle. But then I asked them, OK, now, what can you tell me about this uh, whole puzzle using just these five pieces? And of course, they couldn't tell me anything because uh, it's not enough. 
uh, these five pieces. And so um, then I would take the picture that was on the cover of the jigsaw puzzle and I would show it to them and uh, and then uh, ask them now now tell me about your five pieces because looking at the the picture of the jigsaw puzzle they could work out some context for where in that uh, puzzle the picture that these pieces that they had came from and so uh, so really that is like uh, biblical archaeology the five pieces represent the archaeology um, what is found are just pieces of evidence, and but they are evidence for the reality of uh, of the picture that happened in the ancient past. But really, it's the Bible that is like the picture on the front of a jigsaw puzzle. It gives us the big picture understanding, and uh, and and really, we understand the context of the pieces that are found in archaeology from the Bible. Yeah. When we look at and we think about the textual history of the Bible, even the way that the Dead Sea Scrolls and other manuscripts have have really demonstrated the incredible reliability of the textual traditions, it's amazing that when you look at that and you see the the consistency between the the you know between the variations uh, of the text, it's it's amazing. It far exceeds the archaeological record as we know. So even if we were to um, be very generous and say that uh, there's 5% of what has been excavated is representative, which is a really high number, that would still only be 25 pieces of a 500-piece puzzle. So even there, I think archaeology requires us, for those that pursue it, um, it, it, there is evidence, but it also requires a certain level of humility in our part, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, You know, the truth is, is is we really can't know very much. Um, you know, there's so much reliance on modern technology, but really modern technology doesn't really help very much about trying to figure out what happened thousands of years ago. What you need are ancient texts that were written by uh, eyewitness accounts, you know, from the ancient past that are describing the world that they live in and, and the events that happened and the people that were alive at that time. And then we can uh, bring life to the archaeology. Otherwise, you're just looking at walls and burn destructions and these kinds of things. But you don't know what happened or why it happened or who was involved or you, there, there's no uh, story that comes out of it. So really, um, the Bible is the soul of biblical archaeology. The field, even though it's a secular field, is called biblical archaeology, because between Egypt and Mesopotamia, um, then you need the Bible to really understand uh, the archaeology that's done in those areas. You know, it would be, this is kind of just conjecture on my part, but it would be interesting to think in terms of that if the Bible um, was never around, and then you had, you know, here we are in the 21st century, and you had the, the, the textbooks of archaeology, what they have found and what they thought, and then all of a sudden the Bible appears. It would be interesting to see what they developed, their thinking about these, these lands and these civilizations, etc., without the Bible, and to see how far off they would. So even the secularists, as much as they, they don't want to use sometimes the Bible, it still, it still influences their framework, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, you know, to what you're saying, I mean, when we uh, come face to face with Jesus, right, and he makes our knowledge complete, Mm -hmm. what do we expect? Do we expect to go, oh, yeah, yeah, wow, I had a lot of things figured out and and, uh, I was almost there, you know, with my knowledge, or are we just going to be absolutely, uh, you know, floored by all the things that we didn't know? Mm -hmm. I really think is going to be the latter, um, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, that we can't even imagine what that's going to be like. And so, yeah, um, there's a lot of uh, what I would call hypocrisy in in uh, biblical archaeology, because, for example, uh, Jericho is one of the sites that's used the most um, to to uh, by the skeptics as far as the Bible goes. But um, of course, we wouldn't know that that was Jericho uh, without the Bible. Yeah. The Bible is the ancient text that tells us that that is Jericho, and so nobody would care about it. Nobody would have bothered to dig it. Uh, nobody uh, would be uh, there. Wouldn't be skeptics about it if not for the Bible to bring to light this biblical city and the events that happened there, and that's what they're arguing about. So, so yeah, it's uh, there's so many things like that that the Bible really drives these things. If you look at the sites that have been excavated the most 
in uh, Israel and the surrounding lands, they're the, they're the cities, right? They're the sites that are mentioned the most mm -hmm. and described the most in the Bible. Yep. And the ones that are hardly mentioned in the Bible uh, nobody bothers to dig them. Yeah. You know, on a side note, I want to plug your, your your video that you did on Jericho and the Bible because um, I gave that to one of our tour guides who had never seen it before. And he, 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 was, uh, he was an Orthodox tour guide, but I had brought it because I had played it while we were on the bus, while we were in Israel. And we were going to Jericho and I used it as an intro to when we got there. And uh, it was excellent. And afterwards, the tour guide was like, hey, where can I get this? I go, here, free copy. It's yours. You know, I'll get another one. <laughs> and uh, but it was tremendous. I mean, I, I really encourage people to go to sourceflix.com and, and see some of the other stuff that you've done. But let's transition now to your book, because um, kind of outline, if you will, um, outline your book. How did you put it together? What, what, what were you seeking to, to tell people? Well, I mean, honestly, you know, the, the concept I really wanted to look at was uh, these places where God came down and dealt with different people. And, uh, and so then from that event of him appearing to people um, and speaking to them, then that became sacred ground. And uh, then these places were commemorated at times desecrated um, over the over thousands of years. And so um, there's many, many, many of them. And at first I tried to tackle the whole lot of them, but uh, <laughs> I realized I was never going to get anything out. So I just chose 10 of them and um, focused on those five from the Old Testament and five from the New Testament. And, um, and, and really wanted to, as we talked earlier, I wanted to bring out the soul of, uh, of what the Bible talks about these places. Um, the events that happened in these uh, sites is, are profound and affect us to this day and help us to understand uh, all that Christ has done for us. And so these are all 10 of them are amazing sites. They're, they're all represented. We know those sites because we have, as I say in the book over and over again, one thing on top of another. And so um, when, you're, when you're looking at ancient texts, you're asking the question, how far back do we have copies, you know, and how far back do they date? Uh, it's kind of similar in archaeology. When you have a, an archaeological site, you ask yourself, you're looking down, uh, how far back in time, how mm -hmm. far down uh, in these, do these layers go? And so many of these sites go all the way back to the time of the event in the archaeology that's found and represented there. Mm -hmm. And then what follows that is, um, is all this commemorating um, structures being built or buildings being built to commemorate the uh, event that happened there that turned this place into sacred ground to the people that lived in the region. So we have um, what are called ancient tells. Uh, these, are, these are the cities that are built one on top of another. Uh, in different layers. And so these are these are holy sites. They're sacred sites that are are much smaller than a city or maybe they exist within a city. But they also are one layer on top of another as these events are being commemorated and at times uh, desecrated mm. and then maybe commemorated again after that. So that, the evidence, think of the mound as a monument of evidence for the biblical event. If, if that biblical event didn't cause that mound to grow over literally thousands of years, then what, how, then what is the phenomenon that caused these ancient uh, sites to, uh, to be considered sacred for literally thousands of years? Yeah, t take a couple of minutes to highlight, um, you know, maybe the 10 sites. You know, what's on the list of the 10 that you chose? Yeah, so in the Old Testament, I, I start with a site called Mamre. Um, God appeared to Abraham and Sarah at Mamre and promised them a son in their old age. And uh, of course, this was uh, um, talking about Isaac and then later uh, Jesus, of course, the ultimate fulfillment of that promise. The one that they were told at Mamre uh, through their offspring, they were going to bless all the nations mm -hmm. on earth. And so you have that stack of archaeology um, that goes all the way back to the time of Abraham mm -hmm. and the pottery there. And then you have uh, you have a enclosure there from the time of the kingdom of Israel that commemorates that site. Um, you have uh, Herod the Great building a commemorative enclosure there. And then you have uh, Constantine uh, having a church built there to 
worship the son of Abraham that has blessed all nations. And, um, and so then you, all the way up to uh, the Islamic period that also commemorates that as the uh, campsite of Abraham. And so uh, there's that site. And um, um, then there's Mechapella, where the patriarchs are and matriarchs are buried. Um, that is very similar. Uh, and then there's uh, Mount Moriah, where uh, the temple um, is built in the same place where earlier King David built an altar, where before that Abraham built an altar to uh, sacrifice Isaac. And so you have in this sacred mm. ground on top of Mount Moriah, two altars and then the temple built and then that's destroyed and then it's rebuilt by Zerubbabel. And again, you have this uh, commemoration all the way up to the Islam Islamic period. That's what the Dome of the Rock is been doing up there for 1300 years. And so, um, so that's another example. The difference is you can't excavate yeah. that or you'll probably start World War III. <laughs> um, but yeah. this other site, Mamre, has been excavated down to bedrock. So we can actually mm -hmm. learn a lot about uh, the Temple Mount from the excavations at Mamre. And then I, I also um, go into Bethel, um, another, well, that's where uh, God met with both Abraham and Jacob and Jacob had his dream. Mm -hmm. And it's really the place for Jacob where God became not just the God of his fathers, but uh, his God, his personal yeah. God. And, um, and then uh, also the um, city of David and the palace of David and the tombs of David that were discovered back in 1914 in an excavation. And for uh, many reasons, many of them political, uh, seem to have been mainly forgotten again. But, uh, but I go into the evidence for those. And then in the New Testament, um, there's, Na uh, there's, uh, there's Nazareth that I cover, Bethlehem, which is a site that, uh, that I've personally been involved in excavation work at Bethlehem in the Church of Nativity. Um, uh, very important, of course, the, uh, the uh, crucifixion, place of crucifixion of Jesus and resurrection and uh, all the things that surround that. Um, and, and then also uh, I cover the, um, where Pentecost uh, yeah. happened and where the Holy Spirit was poured out. And again, all these places have this stack of archaeology commemorating these events that come from the Bible. And, and the other one uh, up on the Mount of Olives is the, uh, the stack of archaeology commemorating the ascension yeah. of Jesus. Yeah. And so, yeah, so these are kind of the cream of the crop, but I go into the archaeological evidence, but not only to establish the evidence, but once the evidence is established, to try to bring out, uh, you know, the profoundness of, of what these places mean in the um, salvation story that that God is still playing yeah. out with mankind. You know, let's uh, let I want to come back to that. We're going to take a little break here for for those that are watching, uh, so you can see how to get Joel's book. It's incredible. Again, these are just some of the glimpses of the ten sites, talking about really the way that archaeology brings it to be. So take take a listen. Twenty five hundred years ago, God shared His future plans for the world with His prophets. They recorded them in the 66 books we have today, the Bible, or as some call it, God's love letter to mankind. Over the last 2,000 years, we've watched these prophecies come to pass in remarkable detail. Yet some are still not convinced that these ancient prophecies came from the God of the Bible. Enter the study of biblical archaeology, an exciting trip into the past that opens our eyes to the land of Israel and confirms God's inspired word over and over again. We've read the miraculous stories in the Bible about the walls of Jericho, the Red Sea crossing, Sodom and Gomorrah, the Temple Mount, the Ark of the Covenant, Mount Sinai, Noah's Ark, and so many more miracles and descriptions of places where these things took place. Over the years, we've interviewed many of the people who've explored these fascinating adventures, men like Randall Price, Aaron Lipkin, and Tim Mahoney. Today, we've added yet another archaeology adventurer, Joel Kramer, who documents his many years of research and discoveries in his book, Where God Came Down. 
This exciting archaeology book is available for your gift of $30 or more to support the worldwide outreach of Prophecy Watchers, with shipping included anywhere in the USA. If you're interested in biblical archaeology, there's a way you can get this wonderful book as a free bonus. We've produced two sets of DVDs on Bible archaeology, 12 DVDs in all, that cover many of these biblical discoveries and mysteries. We'd love to send you all 12 DVD studies for your gift of $75 or more, and we'll send Joel's new book along for free. Just call the toll-free number you see on your screen or visit our bookstore at prophecywatchers.tv. When you call, ask for the Israel Archaeology Package. There's nothing quite like visiting the land of Israel. A few years ago, I experienced the trip of a lifetime, experiencing things I never thought possible, sailing on the Sea of Galilee, taking a tour under the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, walking in the footsteps of Jesus and his disciples, a trip I'll never forget. The Prophecy Watchers team, headed up by Mondo and Bob, will be visiting Israel from March 25th through April 4th next year, accompanied by Pastor Larry Allison and ministry friend David Schnitger. I've seen their itinerary and it looks incredible. For more information, go to visitisraeltoday.com where you can see all the details. Nothing would make us happier than having you join us in Jerusalem. It's like no other place on earth and it's the place where Jesus will return one day to make everything in this world right. Thanks for tuning in today, and thanks for supporting Prophecy Watchers and our special guests. Together, we're taking the gospel and the message of Bible prophecy to the world. Well, now that we're back from the break, Joel, um, you know, we got a couple minutes left here. Um, let's talk a little bit about the, kind of in the sense of the concluding thoughts. We, you know, we're, we're Prophecy Watchers, we're into Old Testament prophecy, we see the value of prophecy and archaeology coming together. How, how does this all point really to the truthfulness and the reliability of the gospel, which is, again, is, is given to people for eternal life? How does it come together? Really, when you're, when you're dealing with prophecy, I would say this. I would say uh, a lot of times in archaeology, you're de dealing with the historicity of the Bible. When you start getting into prophecy and you start seeing uh, the archaeological and historical evidence for the prediction and then the uh, the historical and archaeological evidence for the fulfillment, that's really talking about the authority of the Bible. Yeah. Amen. And, Amen. and uh, so that's, that's really powerful. Well, Joel, we're out of time, but I really appreciate it. I hope you're willing to come back all the way from Amman, Jordan, through Skype. Uh, you know, we want to get you back on here because um, well, your book is tremendous. Again, it brings all these things together. And for those that are watching, we appreciate you watching today. Again, you, you're going to want Joel's book as well as go to sourceflix.com and see some of the videos that he's made. We appreciate you watching. We ask for your prayers for the ministries that we're going on here as always, and we will see you next time.